program ya pendidikan bahasa Inggris uh, Fakultas Bahasa dan Seni Universitas Kristen Satewacana. I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of the uh, Faculty of Language and Arts UKSW. I welcome everyone. It's my privilege to be here. It is great to meet Pak Suban Zain again after several years. Uh, during the pan I met him for the last time before the pandemic, and I think we have had a history for quite a long time. Uh, even though I happen to know Pak Suban Zain just recently, but actually we knew each other before before we met and uh, know each other. Um, yeah, this is a, a rare opportunity, especially after the pandemic has subsided and we can meet in person again. Uh, I think it's a, a privilege yeah, once again to have and welcome Pak Suban Sain. I'd like to uh, mention several achievements in, by reading the, what is it, the biography of Pak Suban Sain. Yeah? Uh, Pak Suban Zain, PhD, teaches at Australian National University or ANU in Australia. Yeah. He is a visiting professor at Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia, UP Bandung, Indonesia. His publications include 11 books. He is the author of six refereed monographs, being the, role, being the sole author of three of them, Language Policy in Super Diverse Indonesia, published by Routledge, Routledge in 2020, English as a Subject in Basic Education, or ESBE in ASEAN, a Comparative Study, published by the British Council 2022, and Country Profiles, English as a Subject in Basic educa Education in Cambodia, Laos, Indonesia, Malaysia, Myanmar, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, Recommendations for Policy and Research, British Council 2022. He is editor and lead editor editor of five academic volumes, including Early Language Learning Policy in the 21st Century and International Perspective, Springer, uh, published by Springer 2021, and Early Language Learning and Teacher Education, International Research and Practice, published by Multilingual Matters in 2019. He has taught uh, <clears throat> courses in the context of applied linguistics or TESOL to local Australian students, as well as international students, migrants, and refugees from 90 countries. He has been invited to deliver lectures as well as plenary and keynote speeches at 23 international conferences, symposiums, and research sites in countries including Brazil, China, Colombia, England, Georgia, Singapore, and Vietnam. His works have appeared in refereed journals, including Language Teaching, Professional Development in Education, Journal of Education for Teaching, International Research and Pedagogy, International Journal of Bilingual and Bilingual Education and Applied Linguistics Review. He is Asia TEFL Book Series Editor-in-Chief and Australia's Best Researcher in English Language and Literature for two years running 2021 and 20. 22. So we have a very special guest here, and this is our first e-talk. Yeah, e-talk stands for English Teaching and Applied Linguistics Colloquia, and the topic today happens to be one of the hotly debated uh, topic, understanding translanguaging and super diversity. I'm glad that this is the topic that Pa Suban Zain presents today. I remember offering academic writing course for undergrad students. And uh, we talked about translanguaging, translingual practices. If uh, some of my students got some headache at the time, well, I'm sorry for that. But I think as a language researcher, and even though you are undergrad students, you need to know the current issues in applied linguistics and English language teaching. You might disagree, you might agree, it's up to you. I told my students, but then as long as the literature says something about that, it's something that you need to be aware of. Yeah, before you say you disagree, you need to listen to what the scholars have to say about the theories, including translanguaging and super diversity. Those two topics are interrelated, and I'm glad that we are listening to one of the leading scholars in the world, not only in Indonesia, that specialize in English language teaching. Uh, and I think I've been very privileged to have been 
working with Pak Subansain in certain projects together. Um, I'm still waiting for the result of another uh, um, work that we are working on together. So I think uh, Pak Subansain will present in one or one and a half hours. And after that, we will have a question and answer sessions. So once again, we are privileged to be here to welcome Pak Suban Sain. Without further ado, please welcome Pak Suban Sain. The time and floor are yours. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Joseph M. Smambu. Um, can everyone hear me clearly? Yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'm here at the Sukaeswe campus. I've been informed that this is a new campus. It's a lovely building. It's here since the first time um, I was here. Um, I think I was here in 2006. Yeah, I watched uh, Professor Mambu's presentation at that time, and he was one of the people who inspired me to um, join the profession in English language teaching. So I'm very pleased to be here, and it's a great honor to be able to present um, some of my ideas um, that I've done and that I've conducted um, through my research. Um, and um, it would be an interesting session for me to be able to share this one of you, so hope that uh, the topic that I'm going to present today, uh, as languaging and for diversity, will be of interest. And I would welcome any questions that you may have. So, um, as Professor Mambu earlier said, if you agree or disagree with something, feel free. <laughs> um, that's the whole point um, about um, critical applied linguistics. So. Um, let's just get started. I would like to share my screen here. And by the way, I'm happy. Can you see my screen? Okay, great. Yeah. Yes. That okay. we are well attended. Yeah. Here. Can you see my screen? Our... Yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, we can. All right. See that. So um, the topic is current in applied linguistics, understanding translanguaging and super diversity. Um, the bulk of this talk is taken from my research um, that has been published, um, a book called Language Power Diverse Indonesia, um, the concept of super diversity and the concept of translanguaging are foreign. However, I will draw on um, international context um, and the major focus with Asia because um, the research is drawn on the Indonesian context, and most of these um, participants are Indonesian um, language educators. So the overview is here, super diversity, super diversity in Indonesia, monolingual ideology, plurilingualism, translanguaging, how translanguaging applies in the Indonesian context in for diverse Indonesia, conclusion and references. Let's get to the first part, um, and that is super diversity. I have 62 slides in total, and I have about one and a half hours. I will try to be brief when presenting my ideas. Uh, um, in cases where things are unclear or may need further elaboration, then you are welcome to ask some questions at the end of the presentation. So now the concept of super diversity, what is it? The concept was introduced by British anthropologist named Stephen Verkovich. It is not just about diversity with an addition of the word super in front of it, but it is a lot more than that. With super diversity, we're looking at diversity in a multi-dimensional perspective. So if we know language diversity as um, the situation where we have diverse range of languages, then multi-dimensional perspective on diversity means that we're not just looking at language diversity, but we're also looking at ethnic diversity, cultural diversity, religious diversity, <clears throat> professional diversity, and so on. So for that reason, then 
um, a multidimensional perspective on super diversity means the complex and dynamic um, situation in which most modern societies at the moment are built upon. So that's why in Europe in particular, we have what is called super diverse societies. Now, um, According to some scholars, um, Anita Pavlenko one, being one of them, super diversity is not a new phenomenon because diversity has been there for a long time. Even at the time of the Romans, if you learn words civilization, you, you would know that there were Persian, the Persian Empire, the Sasanian Empire of Persia um, having uh, battled uh, having battles with the Roman Empire. And if you look at the literature, you will find that even at that time, we're talking about the 1600 um, and the 700 um, BC, um, 700. Muted, Pa Subarnsain. Sorry, it's muted. You can repeat some information. I think it's muted. Can you yes. hear me now? Hello? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about super diversity. According to Anita and others, they that um, super diversity is not a new phenomenon because at the time of the Persian and the Roman empires, um, were already the societies highly diverse. You know, however, the idea of super diversity is not only about diversity in terms of demography, social, uh, political, and cultural um, differences or aspects, but according to Jan Blomer, super diversity goes beyond um, diversity of society because we have two major um, two major things um, that um, make. Society. First one is mobility of communication technologies, and the second one is the migration of people. So when we talk about migration of people, then yes, at that time, people during the time of the Roman Empire and, and the Persian Empire were already very diverse. However, they didn't have mobile communication technologies that um, are apparently existing at the moment, and these um, presence of mobile communication technologies uh, makes um, increases the super diverse environment that we are currently living. So that's the counter argument made by Professor Yan Blomer. So when it comes to Indonesia, we already know. Indonesia is a highly diverse society, but our understanding of uh, super diversity is, is only limited to the relationship between language and um, ethnicity. So that's why we have this um, one-way um, relationship of language and ethnicity where a Javanese is somebody who speaks Javanese, where a Papuan is somebody who either speaks um, Asmat or Dani or other languages. However, super diversity is um, a lot more complex than that. As I said earlier, super diversity is not about, is not only about, about language and ethnicity, but also language and culture, language and religion, language and profession, and even language and identity, as in sexual orientation, right? And even religious or spiritual affiliations as what I'm going to talk about later. So when we're talking about super diversity in the Indonesian context, we're looking at not just language and ethnicity, but also language and the other aspects. Yeah. So age, um, sexual orientation, um, geographical area, profession, um, political affiliation, and so on. That's super diversity in the Indonesian context. Now, when we're looking at um, languages in Indonesia and we look at Indonesia as a whole, then this is the map that we have um, in terms of distribution of languages in the country, major regions and islands in Indonesia from Sumatra to Papua. And we will see that um, one major area in Indonesia where languages are spread the most, it is Papua. Papua has got 384 languages 
by comparison, in Java and Ali, we have 10 languages. We have 26 languages in Sumatra, 57 in Kalimantan, and 58 in um, Sulawesi. So having this so many languages, Indonesia is currently placed second in the world after Papua New Guinea, and most diverse linguistic ecology in the world. So Papua New Guinea has got 841 languages. Indonesia, according to one research, has got 707, and then 728, according to another research. So in total, Indonesia has got more than 700 languages. Um, the statistics notwithstanding, we can differentiate those languages, we can categorize them into different um, types of languages. The first one is the national language, which is Indonesian, the indigenous languages, regional lingua francas, um, heritage languages, sign languages, languages in the religious domain, foreign and additional languages such as Arabic, French, German, Japanese, Korean, and Mandarin, and English as a lingua franca. So this characterization of elements of Indonesia's linguistic ecology comes from my book, Language Policy in Superdiverse Indonesia. Uh, if you're interested, the link is available there. Now, um, having these um, elements of Indonesia's linguistic ecology, there are many analyses um, of Indonesia's social linguistic situation. There are scholars who have already conceptualized different theories. For example, Professor Joseph Lobianco, one of my PhD supervisors, um, said that Indonesia is a case of diglosia in multilingualism. Other um, theories include complex multilingual diglosia by Professor Anton Moliono, polyglosia by Steinhauer, and complex polyglosia. Um, upon reflection, these concepts, however, cannot account for the complexity, dynamism, and polycentricity of Indonesia's linguistic ecology. And why that is the case? <laughs> I outline 11 reasons why previous concepts um, are not um, accountable. And one of the biggest um, reasons is because of the presence of regional linguas, lingua francas. So um, in my linguistic analysis, we have what it's called language hubs. And those language hubs connect um, the use of language at the national level and the use of language at the local level. That is the role of regional lingua francas. We call that RLFs. So there are many languages, for example, Ambon, Malay, Bakumpai, Musi, Ngaju, and Onion. So they are traditionally defined as local or regional languages. However, they actually are there in order to ensure mutual intelligibility within a group of cognate languages in a given region. So for that reason, they have they serve the role as a lingua franca, right, at regional level. That's why we call them regional lingua francas. And in my calculation, we have 43 of them. 14 of them are Malayic, and 29 of them are non-Malayic. And that means that there are 14 regional lingua francas that are related to Malayan varieties, and 29 of them that are not related to Malay varieties. So for example, Bakumpai is a non-Malayic RLF, and then Ambon Malay is a Malayic RLF. Now, because of that reason, then we need a new concept. And the concept that I'm proposing here is superglosia. This concept aims to explain the complex, dynamic, and polycentric nature of a super diverse linguistic ecology. So the definition that I'm giving for superglossia is that it is a polycentric social linguistic situation in which linguistic varieties and practices of language mixing interact and perform relationships that are complex, uh, dynamic, often interglossic, and sometimes intraglossic, reflecting their varying degrees of status influence and order of importance. So if you are wondering what it means by interglossic and intraglossic, the explanation would go like this. With intraglossic, you have Javan, um, you have a language such as Javanese that has um, hierarchy, right? In Javanese, we have at least three major um, 
process. We have the media, uh, sorry, we have the chromo, we have media, and then we have the knockle. That is the high, the medium, and the low varieties. So that's called intra because it is inside the language. With interglossic, that means it's between languages. So if we compare Japanese and um, Maduris, for example, we have a society in Surabaya, for example, where two uh, ethnics live um, together, the Japanese and the Maduris, which language is going to be used by um, those societies? Is it Japanese or is it Maduris? In fact, when we have in Surabaya, it is Japanese that is more dominant. So for that reason, then Japanese is considered higher than Maduris. So that is an interglossic situation, the relationship between two languages, when one is considered to be more important or more prestigious, when one is considered to be higher than the other language or the other linguistic variety. So that is interglossic. So with, uh, with this definition in mind, what we have is that linguistic varieties, as in dialects, linguistic varieties, as in languages, right, going hand in hand with practices, language mixing. So I use this phrase practices of language mixing as, a, as an umbrella term because we have so many different terminologies. Right? We have so many different terminologies trying to explain the phenomena happening in the field when it comes to the use of different um, features of different languages. We have code mixing, we have code switching, and then now we have this translanguaging. There is also what is called code meshing. There is another one called polylanguaging and so on. These are all basically practices of language mixing. So I use this, this um, phrase as an umbrella term. So linguistic varieties and practices of language mixing, they interact and they perform relationships that are complex and dynamic, often interglossic and sometimes intraglossic. Intra so by that, we have the whole um, linguistic ecology of Indonesia, then we will find different degrees of status, influence, and order of importance of those languages. And for that reason, then we will find that um, when it comes to, if we go back to um, slide seven, then we will find that there, there are so many different languages um, in the field there are so many languages in the field, but they may have different order of um, importance. So for example, Indonesian is, a, is the national language and it is very important at the national level. It is very important for um, formal um, ceremonies. It is very important for official events and so on. However, when we go to Papua, for example, we're not using Indonesian as the standard language because in there we have Papuan Indonesian. We also have Papuan Malay. And these are two different linguistic varieties. Papuan Indonesian as an indigenized variety of Indonesia and Papuan Malay as in the indigenous variety of Malay. And you can see that Malay and Indonesia are two different linguistic varieties. Indonesian is uh, a kind of um, derivation, right, of of, of Malay, um, the Riau dialect of Malay that emerged in um, Riau in the 19th century. So with this in mind, when we try to compare it in the local context in Papua, and we go to places such as, we go to places such as um, Wandamen, then we'll find that Indonesian is actually not used at all. Right, the language that has um, greater importance in Wandaman is not Indonesian. The language that has greater importance in Wandaman is actually Papua Malay, right? Not even Papua Indonesia. That's just one example. In other places, Indonesia, in Sumatra, in Java, Kalimantan, and so on, the same case applies. So you will find there are many major indigenous languages or even um, regional lingua francas that actually have stronger importance than the national language. So for that reason, the situation is no longer monocentric because with monocentric, we have only Indonesian as we have Indonesian as the only center of importance. Now we have polycentric, 
yeah, polycentricity, because the order of importance varies depending on the geographical location, depending on other contexts that just trade, religion and spirituality, cultural aspect, and so on. So that's why we have polycentricity. So having that in mind, then superglossia accounts for the complexity um, and dynamism of the Indonesian linguistic situation. Um, the concept appears in my book, as I said, as I said language policy in super diverse Indonesia. Um, it has been reviewed um, four times in major journals, including Melbourne Asia Review and Language Policy. And um, this is one of them. Um, this is a review by Professor um, Howard Munz from Monash University. And um, he's one of the people who agree with my idea um, of super diversity. And my whole point is about this, the complex series of hubs and peripheries. Right, so the complex series of hubs and periphery, peri peripheries that make up the Indonesian linguistic context, because this is the missing link which many scholars have neglected, or which many scholars have not taken into account. Now, let's go on to the context of super diversity in Indonesia. How does that apply? Um, what are some of the examples? Um, that we can see so that we can understand the whole context of um, super diversity as it relates to translanguaging at a later stage. So the first one, um, you must, some of you may be familiar with this name, Ali Topan. Professor Joseph, have you heard of Ali Topan? Hmm, yes. Yes? Yeah, so for some of you, Ali Topan represents uh, generation right so according to the literature uh, this emerged in the 1970s uh, 19 uh, late 1970s early 1980s ali topan at that time um, was a symbol of resistance and rebellion and ali topan was somebody who represented a generation what kind of generation it is this generation the pro camp generation Prokem generation had a language on their own. It is called the Bahasa Prokem. So there are many um, scholars from overseas. Two of them um, were Schambert Loa and Collins who observed the Prokem language. Yeah? So uh, Professor Virginia Hooker um, from ANU also observed the Prokem language. And this is based on the research of um, Professor Schambert Loa and Professor Collins. Um, Prokem is a kind of language that mixes together foreign words, right? So, for example, stone and fly, Roger, yeah, anti acoustic, nyentrik, neptop, photocopy, and then Jakarta words such as keki, srek, umpet, yahud, and then Sundanese and Javanese words, for example, bordel, trenu, dahar, oga, right? And a number of others, right? Sometimes, um, they create their own words and abbreviations. This term means um, people, people who rebel against the rule, right? So that's why we have the word um, prokem. So for some prokem um, is related to the presence of certain people, right? That um, work with crimes. So usually, uh, Prokem are associated with criminals and gangsters, and there were many of them at the time in the early 1980s. So in the Prokem language, Jakarta students, especially um, high school students at the time, they showed their linguistic creativity by mixing linguistic codes of different languages. So for example, Indonesian, Batawi, English, and other elements of, of um, indigenous languages. So for example, Javanese and Sundanese. So that's why we have, excuse me, words from Sundanese and Javanese, such as Bodol, right, Trenyu, Dahar, and Oga. And then we also have um, words coming from foreign words, such as stone and fly, yeah, Jadi stone itu, um, as in related to marijuana, in your stupor and fly, the fly, yeah. So if you have heard the term, the fly, that means that you have been affected by marijuana or ganja. That's the 
local word. And then Roger, which means up to you, antic, then acoustic, which means beautiful and sleek and attractive, and then yentric, yeah. Um, and then um, Jakarta words or Betawi, we have keki, srek, umpet, and yahud. And then there are also some phrases that have been um, developed, right? Um, that were developed by um, the program people. So they created new words such as blow on, cha'am, acuk, and then tongpes. Tongpes is still used until now, which means kantong kempes, yeah? And ger, which means gede rasa. So kantong kempes means broke, and then gede rasa means conceited or full of self-importance. And then um, the idea of the program language uh, developed right um, until uh, mid 1990s. So as a social linguistic phenomenon, um, language ne is never static. Language always um, evolves. Language always um, generates. Language always generates new things. So that's why from the program, um, we have what is called Bahasa Gaul. Gaul as an ideology articulates a rejection, right? Mm -hmm. Rejection, and it also shows some kind of um, rebellion as well. However, it is a lot different than program because in here, we have more sociability. So it shows um, our rebellion against patrimonialism, formality and fixed social hierarchy. However, what replaced PROCAM is the GAUL terminology. And this term GAUL designates closeness, the friendliness and the ability to embrace social activities and communality. So someone who is GAUL is someone who is um, easily who is able to connect with other people, someone who is friendly, someone who is socially um, active, right? And someone who has communal orientation. That is someone, um, that's the meaning of someone who is a Gaul person. So um, the idea of Gaul personality is then, um, is then represented in terms of um, language, in terms of communication, when we have um, different people promoting different words and phrases that are then made popular. And there are two major celebrities who have made them popular. One of them is Ivan Gunawan, and the other one is Cinta Laura. So among the young people, especially the millennials, this um, two young people are very famous, and there are some of the people who make Bahasa Gaul very prominent, especially among the people living in Jakarta, Bogor, Depok, and um, adjacent areas. So, for example, Ivan Gunawan popularized so what gitu lo, which means who cares, right? And then Ivan Gunawan also made it please de lo to ya, yeah, which means please, you really come on, right? And then Cinta Laura is a um, public figure who made it popular, who made witches very popular among the young people. And in one of the um, remarks that she made, she said something like, Uda gue kasih tau, which is yesterday. So here, Cinta Laura and um, Evan Gunawan uses words and um, phrases from English, you know, with Indonesian, with um, with Batawi and other languages, and they have become part of their um, communication features. And when they do that, they usually um, said their statements in playful prosody, and sometimes by a shrug, right, accompanied by a shrug or laughter. And one of the uh, major characteristics, one of the major characteristics of, yes, kenapa tidak bisa lagi? Mau 
Okay, do you want to do it? Yeah. Okay, yeah, baik. Okay, um, one of the major features of um, Bahasa Gaul is um, the use of abbreviations. So abbreviations are basically, we have words that are shortened together. So we have JJS as in JJS, which means Jalan Jalan Sore. That means to walk around or hang out um, in the afternoon. And then we also have Pede or Percaya Diri, which means to believe in oneself or self confident. And then we have um, HTI, which means hubungan tanpa ikatan, um, and that translates into relations without legal connection or illicit sex, or um, HTS, hubungan tan tanpa status. And one public figure who made um, Bahasa Gaul abbreviations popular is Debi Sahertian. So in the past, Debi Sahertian made it um, very popular um, made it very popular expressions such as cucok meong. Yeah, cucok meong laya bau, laya obo, yeah, i gemes de eke, yeah. So in the past, people would say, i gemes de eke, you know, very, very um, frequently. Um, and that means that's very suitable, dude. Oh, I feel ticklish, yeah. So that's another example. And then um, if we look at if we look at the case of Bahasa Prokem and Bahasa Gaul, then um, we're looking at diversity in terms of age because we're dealing with young people in here, right? However, di super diversity is not only um, the diversity in terms of age, but also in terms of geographical location. Because what we have here is the emergence of anak jaksel, and then we also have anak bandung, and then we have what it's called anak salatiga, right? So the first one you must be familiar with anak bandung, right? Um, the idea of anak, sorry, with anak jaksel, because in here, usually they campur campur bahasanya. So ngomong, oh yeah, I'll meet you, yeah, nanti ketemu di CBD uh, or di PIP, and then they would use different words. Um, using the Bahasa Gau. And the same with um, Anak Bandung, except that with the Anak Bandung, they add um, Sundanese. So with Anak Jaksel, they add um, Betawi language, yeah, the Betawi language. With the Anak Bandung, they add the Sundanese. And then with Anak Salatiga, they add Javanese. So this is um, part of a research by Professor Lauren Zent, who um, did research in Salatiga. Um, identifying the use of mixed languages of Indonesia, English, and Japanese among the Salatiga people, um, especially the Salatiga young, um, young people. Uh, research by Professor Jenar from University of um, Sydney um, identifies the use of um, Indonesian, um, Sundanese, and English. So, for example, in here we have, oh, ngobrol aja itu teh, yeah. So, Teh as in um, phrase that comes from the um, Sundanese language. And then they would add that with Indonesian and also with Batawi and also with English as in let's do something. So things like this have become very prominent in uh, among the young people in Indonesia. But this is not just about um, age differences or age diversity. It is also about regional diversity, which adds to the complexity of Indonesian super diversity. As I said earlier, if Bahasa Prokem and Bahasa Gaul relate to um, diversity in terms of age, then Anak Bandung, Anak Jaksel, and Anak Salatiga, we're talking about diversity in terms of regional um, distribution or geographical uh, distribution. Now, um, this is something interesting, diversity in terms of sexual orientation. There are a group of people, right? And um, I know um, I have friends who are among these people and they um, have their own codes, yeah? Um, those in Australia, for example, and those in Indonesia, this one is a famous um, gay um, advocate. Um, one of the famous gay advocates, and um, he, use, he uses friends phrases such as lekong and then benches and then lekes, you know, and samong. These are phrases that are not familiar, uh, that many people outside the community are not familiar with. So if somebody says to you lekes or lekong, 
right? And you're not part of the community, you wouldn't know what that means, right? However, this register of belonging indicates, you know, another part of diversity, and that is diversity in terms of sexual orientation. So, for example, um, one um, statement here says, masalahnya kita memang semong begitu suka menggoda orang. So semong here um, is a new term that they create um, in replacement of sama, which means same, right? So semong, it becomes, um, so, so sama, it becomes semong. And then laki, yeah, lelaki, right? And it becomes lekong. So lekong, lekong means laki-laki. So um, you can see the creativity of this group of people in terms of um, communicating their ideas, right, with people within their community. And if we are not part of them, then we wouldn't be able to understand what they're saying. You have to be part of their community to be able to understand what they're saying, or you have to research what they're saying, and then you will understand. Of course, they would also use abbreviations, just like the mainstream community. People who are not gay or not lesbian um, use the abbreviations. They, this um, gay people, they also use abbreviations. However, their own words, you know, um, use the register of belonging of the gay community. Um, the use of these words is more prominent. Now, the next one is diversity in terms of um, religion or in terms of spirituality. We have what is called the Hijra community. So if you are familiar with people such as Ustad Adi Hidayat, Khalid Basalama, and so on, then you would know um, the presence of a community, right? Ustad um, Abdul Samad, for example, from Riyadh, yeah? Uh, you would, um, you would, notice the presence of a community um, that tries to that tries to mix the Indonesian language with the Indone indigenous language and the Arabic language. So if we have the Gaul community and then the Prokem community, these two communities, they perceive the English language as the language of prestige, then in the Hijra community, English is not the language of prestige. The language of prestige is the language that is associated with the Islamic religion, and that is Arabic. So that's why the mix of words from Arabic and Indonesian and sometimes indigenous languages is very prominent. So here's one example that I have heard so many times. So someone would say, hey, antum mesti tawadu akhi, gak boleh ispal. Uh, which means, hey, you should be humble, brother. You can't have pants exceeding the ankles. So as you can see here in the photograph, there's somebody who is um, not doing the isbal. If you have a, if you're wearing pants, you, um, according to one of their, um, one of the religious traditions that they believe, the hadith, um, you cannot have um, the pants um, below um, the ankles, even though according to many others, it doesn't really matter because the point about arrogance, right? Because they think that if you have uh, pants below the ankles, it shows arrogance, right? Even though according to the mainstream Muslim, that doesn't really matter because arrogance is not about what you're wearing. Arrogance is about attitudes. So it's a different interpretation. However, this idea is then um, taken to the use of language in communication so that somebody would say something like, eh, antum mesti tawadu ahi, yeah. So ahi here means brother, coming from Arabic. Tawadu is also from Arabic, which means humble. Antum, right? Ana, antum, ana, antum, I and you. They also come from Arabic. Antum means you, and then isbal means an, um, um, having pants exceeding the ankles. And then gak boleh, right? This come from the Batawi language, of course. So I call this phenomenon as linguistic piety. And the idea of linguistic piety is also apparent in the fact that newborn babies are now named, newborn babies are now um, named with Arabic um, words. So Arabic names incorporating Arabic words or phrases, yeah? And then, uh, and in, so somebody would have five, six, seven names, right? And then only one of them is Indonesian original name, 
Other names are in Arabic from Muhammad, Rizki, Sufyan, and so on. These are all Arabic names. And then they also incorporate words, right, and phrases from the Arabic language. They incorporate them into conversations. And when they do that, they see it as a sign of piety, right, rather than submission to linguistic domination. Okay, so um, this phenomenon uh, perceived to be are not perceived to be cultural subservience either. So this is something that I find it um, quite hypocritical because on the one hand, people would um, criticize other people using English words, right, as being subservient to the Western culture. However, when they use the Arabic words, they don't see it as people being subservient to the Arabic culture, okay? So for that reason that I don't think, um, I think it's like a double standard, right? Happening at the social level, which um, myself um, totally, um, uh, which I myself um, do not agree with entirely. And then now, um, how does the concept of super diversity relate to translanguaging? Okay, in order to understand how super diversity uh, relates to translanguaging, we need to understand a few other concepts first. The first one is monolingual ideology. What is monolingual ideology? It is a concept that is best represented by the slogan, one language, one nation, and one people. So the German language, for example, represents the German land and the German people. So at the time of um, Immanuel Kant and Johann um, von Goethe, for example, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, they had Aufklaro or the Enlightenment era during the um, German, um, during the German uh, intellectual advancement after the Renaissance. So they made it very, um, they made it very clear that the German language represents the German land and it also represents the German people. It's a kind of ideology that studied in Germany and then um, was widespread in Europe. And then it is also adopted during the time of the independence wars, right? Um, in, the, uh, in the early 20th century. So it is generally assumed to be natural and normal that a language represents a people or a nation. It is pervasive, it is found around the world. So that's why President Sukarno in the early years of our independence always highlighted the idea of Indonesian people being able to speak the Indonesian language. Satu negara, satu bahasa, satu bangsa. Yeah, seperti itu idenya. Now, um, the monolingual ideology is in line with structuralist linguistic. So if you're familiar with the name Ferdinand de Saussure, the Swiss, um, the father of modern linguistics, he proposed the idea of language as a system or a code. And a language is enumerable, which means that you can count it. And a language is a compartmentalized entity, which means a language as a structure, a language as a structure that is separated from other structures. So if you have one language and other languages, then that language is separated from other languages in terms of the structure. So that's why languages are segregate, are seen as segregated and compartmentalized. So that's the basic idea of structuralist linguistics. So Japanese as a system, as a linguistic structure, it is different from Korean, right? And then Pashtun, right? If you know the language of Pashtun, which is spoken mainly in Afghanistan and parts of India. So if you know um, Shah Rukh Khan, the famous actor, he's a Pashtun, right? He also speaks Hindi, right? So Pashtun is a language, okay, which is different from Hindi. Okay, so Japanese as a as a system, and then Korean as a system, Pashtun as a system, and then Hindi as another system. And then we also have new other terms, right, that signify the importance of language segregation. Um, what are they? The first one is code mixing and the second one is code switching. With code mixing, we have mixing of Japanese and Korean together. So Korean words and Japanese words together, we call them code mixing. Um, and then when we switch from Japanese to Korean or vice versa, then we have code switching. Okay, so when we have terms such as code mixing and code switching, these are terms that are inherited from structuralist linguistics. 
And then the idea of monolingual ideology and structuralist linguistic is also related to the idea of native speakerism. So if you're familiar with the name of Noam Chomsky, he is the father of um, modern, he's also another father of modern linguistic, and he's one of the people who um, advocates um, the importance of a native speaker, because for people like him, a native speaker is the only reliable source the only reliable source of linguistic data. So he or she is the ideal speaker listener, listener in a completely homogeneous speech community. So this leads to the idea of native speakerism in which native speakers uh, being the language models, right? This idea um, represents a distorted worldview that supports a particular vested interest. So people such as Professor Adrian Holliday said, Adrian Holliday said that native speakerism is uh, basically promoted by the ELT industry so that they could, you know, um, expand their business. They could um, earn a lot of money um, by having the so-called native brand. And then um, it also relates to the idea of a monolingual view of bilingualism. What does it mean? Um, a monolingual view of bilingualism means that somebody having competencies in two languages means that somebody who um, have two languages in one brain. So the bilingual is two monolinguals in one person. That's according to Professor Grosjean. Now, when we look at um, these photos, right, we have many different theories and sometimes we read those theories and it's really confusing. Sometimes having, you know, photographs or um, diagrams or um, images such as this one would simplify many things. So this is what I've got um, in terms of monolinguals and bilinguals. A monolingual, we have one balloon, right? Somebody who speaks one language having one balloon. Somebody who has two um, languages at equal level of proficiency is a bilingual having two balloons at, at about um, similar size. And then somebody, another bilingual whose language is more dominant than the other, right? Is this kind of bilingual. One balloon is bigger than the other balloon. So one bigger balloon signifies the language that is more dominant than another language, which is represented by the smaller balloon. So if we look at the, um, this image, then the multilingual mind looks like this. If somebody speaks Indonesian, English, and Arabic, then we have the brain of the person, right, being separated where Arabic is located somewhere here, Bahasa Indonesia is here, and English is here. In terms of ling neural linguistics, the, the big question here is, is this really true, ah, right? And then we'll find out the answer later. And then because of that reason, then it leads to different views uh, in society, right? And these views are pervasive. They are around the world, embraced by people around the world. The idea, the first idea is that languages are seen as fixed and stable, right? And then by fixed and stable, that means the languages cannot change. The languages are just like that. They, um, they are static, they are not dynamic. The second one is that languages are discrete entities. And by discrete, that means they are separated from one another. So that's why we have English, the expression of English being separate uh, from as a system from Mandarin. And then Indonesian is a separate system from Sundanese. And then the third view is that languages should be standardized. So all languages should have uh, standards in which everybody should conform, right? English has its own standard, Indonesian has its own standard, Mandarin has its own standard. When it comes to language testing and assessment, yes, of course, having language standards is very important. However, in terms of communication, probably not so much. And then the next one is language practices other than the standardized are seen as deviations. 
So that's why we have this extreme example, right? If you're familiar with British English, then with British English itself, it's got so many dialects, you know, the kind of English spoken in Scotland is different from the kind of English spoken in Manchester, in Liverpool, in Oxford, and in London. And we have what it's called the Queen English, right? The Queen's English is the standard English, which according to this person, um, should be spoken by everybody living in the flat, right? So that's why he says something like, we do not tolerate people speaking other languages than English in the flats. We are now our own country again, and the Queen's English is the spoken tongue here. So this comes after the Brexit phenomenon in 2016. And then in America, same thing. We have many people, right? In some restaurants, for example, we would find this... Um, image here. This is America. Uh, when ordering, please speak English. Management reserves the right to refuse service. This photo was so important, was so interesting to Professor Bernard Spolsky that he made it as a cover of his book, Language Management. This idea means that everybody, when you are in America, you cannot speak Japanese, you cannot speak um, Spanish, which for many Americans, um, Spanish means uh, Mexican language instead of the Spanish language. So that's the, the case. And they cannot speak um, Chinese either. You have to speak English. That's according to some um, Americans having this monolingual ideology. So having one language only should underpin language practices, language education policy, and language teaching. As in TP, teaching English through English, for example, uh, being embraced by the South Korean government. Now, there's one term that is um, also related to that, and it is plurilingualism. Before we understand translanguaging, we need to understand plurilingualism. Plurilingualism is an important movement that departs from the monolingual ideology. It is the ability to use more than one linguistic variety to differing degrees and for different purposes. That's the definition given by Professor Kristin Hellop. And this idea of plurilingualism means that somebody has, a, has competence in more than one language, and this person can switch between multiple languages depending on the situation for ease of communication. So in here, we have a repertoire of varieties of language which many individuals use. So that's some individual and some might be plurilingual. And this idea of plurilingualism should not be confused with multilingualism, because with multilingualism, you have the presence in a geographical area, large or small, of more than one variety of language, so that in such area, individuals may be monolingual, speaking only their own variety. So plurilingualism is different from multilingualism. If with plurilingualism, you're looking at individuals' competence in different languages. With multilingualism, you're looking at context. You're looking at geographical area, languages interacting at a societal level. For example, Sydney, Toronto, New York, London, and so on. So here's an example. You have visualization of plurilingualism and multilingualism. Plurilingualism means somebody who speaks Portuguese, English, and Italian, right? Happening in the brain. So plurilingualism works in the brain. Multilingualism works in, in geography, works in a certain area. So in this area, um, somewhere in Toronto, um, in, in, in that area, uh, there are many people speaking Korean, Chinese, Portuguese, Italian, and, and Greek, right? Not just English, even though the mainstream language in that area in Toronto is, is English. And also some, some people who speak French, of course. Now, plurilingualism, right, means that somebody may be born in Brazil and that person speaking Portuguese, of course, and then that person travels to Ecuador and then that person learns Spanish and then he learns English because he visits the United States and then marrying somebody from Italy. And as a result, um, learning Italian. So that's a plurilingual individual. In the Indonesian context, plurilingualism is the norm because we have people, right? And it is unusual, the Sundanese people who are fluent in the Indonesian language, in addition to their first language, in this case, Sundanese. So a Sundanese 
um, would be able to speak Indonesian, but also um, he or, she, or she has a fair grasp of Jap Japanese and um, some Batawi. So plurilingualism, everybody in Indonesia, nearly everybody in Indonesia, as long as they are not monolingual, is actually a plurilingual. So plurilingualism abounds in the Indonesian context. It is just that we don't really know the term for the phenomenon. Now, if we have a diagram, then a pluriling plurilingualism as a um, linguistic phenomenon looks like this, L1, um, native level, and then L2, B1 level, and then L3 as in A, A2 level. That's according to the CFR, the Common European Framework of Languages. So that's plurilingualism. So as I said, plurilingualism is a departure, right, from the monolingual ideology, because monolingual ideology means you only have one language that determines everything. However, plurilingualism um, acknowledges diversity in the use of languages. However, plurilingualism is still influenced by structuralist linguistics. Okay, and that is the problem. With translanguaging, however, we don't have that. And I will show you why it is different from plurilingualism. Now, the idea of translanguaging, okay, um, so that we don't confuse with this, then we go step by step with the morphological um, changes. It comes from language as in noun, and then languaging as a process. So languaging as a verb. So for pe people such as Professor um, Meryl Swain, languaging means the cognitive process of negotiating and producing meaningful, comprehensible output as part of language learning as a means to mediate cognition, that is to understand and to problem solve. So when we communicate, right, we are not just communicating, but we're also having this cognitive process inside of our mind because we try to negotiate input and then we try to produce meaningful comprehensible output and this process of meaning making and shaping knowledge and experience through language is called languaging that's according to um, professor Merrill Swain if that happens in one linguistic variety translanguaging means this whole process involving two or three or four different linguistic varieties so with translanguaging you have all languages combined without borders. So that's why the brain looks like this. All languages, Arabic, um, Persian, Portuguese, Spanish, German, French, Indonesian, Javanese, and so on, they are all combined in the brain. There are no linguistic borders and they are against the fixity of languages. Languages in here, they interact with one another, they evolve, they develop, right? And they influence other languages and they are being influenced by other languages. So that's why the use of language is fluid. The use of language is very mobile. This is the whole concept of linguistic repertoire. So with translanguaging, right? With translanguaging, you also have other terms that are quite similar, even though the context in which these terms um, are used is very different. So we have metrolingualism, polylanguaging, code meshing, heteroglossia. The most prominent term is translanguaging at the moment. In my um, definition of superglossia, I use practices of language mixing, mixing to encompass these terms. Okay? However, at the moment, the term that is very uh, popular is translanguaging. So now, if we um, try to dissect the term of translanguaging, if we try to get deeper into the concept, then we will identify that translanguaging does not come from trans um, from structuralist linguistics. That's why translanguaging is not the same with code mixing or code switching. Okay, so translanguaging is not the same with code switching or code mixing. As I said earlier, code switching and code mixing come from structuralist linguistics. Translanguaging, however, does not come from structuralist linguistics because translanguaging comes from the idea of repertoire where language does not have borders, just like what we have here in this person's brain. So there are no 
linguistic borders. Whereas with code switching and code mixing, you can see the borders between those languages. And then translanguaging happens among bilinguals, right? Um, the repertoire is a uni unitary system. That's why we call it translanguaging. In here, the definition is very simple by Professor Ophelia Garcia. She says, um, the translanguaging is the entire linguistic repertoire of bilingual people as they adjust their fluid discourse to different social, cultural, and political contexts. So with translanguaging, again, a diagram that would simplify everything looks like this, Thai and English going together. We don't have big circles separating Thai and English, but we have a big circle that unites Thai and English together. We have TL space, which means the target language space to become one. It is permeable, which means that there are no boundaries between Thai and English. So somebody who translanguages between Thai and English, actually that person does not have two separate systems in their brain. That person actually uses different features of Thai and English as one unitary repertoire. Okay, so that's the big difference. And then another definition of uh, translanguaging has to do with the uh, ideological understanding of language um, itself, because translanguaging is basically the deployment of a speaker's full linguistic repertoire without regard for watchful adherence to the socially and politically defined boundaries of named and usually national and state languages. So um, just to make it simple, we need to look at it like this. If we, if we are talking about Indonesia and, and Bahasa Malaysia, are they different languages? According to, the, to linguistics, they are not different languages. They are one language, two different dialects of one language, and that language is Malay. However, the Malay people, they However, the Malay people and the Indonesian people will have to separate them, right? Uh, because we have this political um, differentiations of the two states. One is the state of Indonesia and the other one is the state of uh, Malaysia, right? So that's why the Malaysian people would be angry if you tell them that they're speaking the Indonesian language, in which case they admire Indonesian singers and they understand Indonesian songs, right? However, they cannot, they are not happy if you tell them that they're speaking in the, in the Indonesian language. The same with the Indonesian people. We're not happy if people tell us that we're speaking the Bahasa Malaysia because we have our own language. So what is it yeah, called Bahasa Indonesia? So what is it that makes it Bahasa Malaysia and Bahasa Indonesia? It is not the linguistic differentiation. It is the political differentiation of Malaysia and Indonesia. It's the same with Spanish and Portuguese. It's the same with um, Norwegian and Swedish, right? Where people from Norwegia and, and people from Sweden, they could understand each other, but they have to separate the two languages because Sweden is a separate country from Norwegia. You cannot say the Swedish people speak Norwegian and you cannot say the Norwegian people, the Norwegian people speak Swedish. So these are social construction, ideological construction, political construction that differentiate these languages as separate languages. The question is, are they linguistic differentiation? Obviously not. So for that reason, then translanguaging, translanguaging does not care about the social and cultural and ideological and political and political boundaries of these named languages. Because in our brain, when we would like to mix Indonesian and Javanese and English, do we actually tell our brain that, okay, first I'm going to add one word from Indonesian, another word from English, another word from Javanese. Do we actually do that in our brain? No, we don't do that. Everything just happens, right? Everything just happens. Um, instantaneously. There is no direct command from our brain um, telling different parts of our brain to activate, you know, one part of our brain that has English, another part that has um, Indonesian, another part that has Javanese, or another part that has Mandarin. No, we don't do that. Everything is just retrieved, you know, instantaneously. So that 
um, they can be used, different features, uh, different linguistic features can be used, even though they come from uh, politically defined um, languages, socially defined languages, uh, they come from different languages politically and socially, but they are used linguistically as part of one utterance or one statement. And they are um, seen as um, having the same equality, right? Rather than different um, political or ideologically uh, prestigious, you know, in which one language is considered more prestigious than others. As in the case of Bahasa Gaul, where English is usually considered more prestigious than Indonesian, more prestigious than Javanese language, or Arabic that is considered more prestigious than Indonesian or other indigenous languages. So for that reason, then plurilingualism is not the same with translanguaging because plurilingualism, we perceive speakers as possessing compartmentalized languages and that is influenced by structuralist linguistics, as I said earlier, whereas translanguaging sees speakers as possessing a unitary linguistic system. And this unitary system is built through social interactions of different types. It goes beyond structuralist linguistics. And by interactions of different types, that means interaction that shows super diversity in different contexts. Diversity in terms of language um, is shown in terms of diversity, in terms of age, of geographical distribution, of um, social status, of cultural orientation, sexual orientation, and so on. So that's why um, having this diversity in any context, not just Indonesia, um, you would speak differently when you talk to your mother um, from when you talk to young people, right? And that's diversity in terms of age. And then diversity in terms of religious um, orientation, then you have that um, hijra community that speaks um, a language, you know, um, in such a high regard, Arabic you know, with a, such a high regard. And then people trying to observe that community, they don't really understand what they're saying because they have different type of community and that community is very much influenced by the Islamic teachings you know that um, are held um, in a very um, constricted way by those by those people in that community and then plurilingualism is also not the same with translanguaging because plurilingualism aims to help plurilinguals possess a repertoire of languages whereas translanguaging help language users to use semiotic features to make meaning in ways that transcend linguistic boundaries. In other words, with plurilingualism, you still see the linguistic boundaries, but in translanguaging, you no longer have linguistic boundaries. With translanguaging, the two languages of a bilingual individual are not stored separately, as in the model of separate underlying proficiency, right? But they coexist and rely on a common and not separate underlying language proficiency. Now, from this point on, we will understand translanguaging in super diverse Indonesia means the emergence of this uh, phenomena that I explained earlier from Bahasa Prokem, Bahasa Gaul, Bahasa Gado Gado, Anak Jaksel, Anak Bandung, Anak Salatiga, Gay Language, and Linguistic Piety, right? These are all phenomena, right, that have occurred because people mix different varieties, okay, different features are uh, coming from different linguistic varieties in a translanguaging manner. People do it all the time. They just don't realize that they're actually doing it. So the Indonesian people, I would say, this is my own cultural observation, Indonesians are the doers, right? They do it, but they don't really know the theoretical concept. Why? Because there, many of them are not the thinkers, you know? It is very different from the Greek civilization. So if you learn Greek civilization, for example, um, Greek civilization, we had lots of scholars from Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, um, Anaxagoras, uh, Aristarchus of Stamos, and so on. They are the thinkers, you know, and then who are the doers? The doers are, were the Romans because they invaded lots of different countries, right? Indonesia um, does not invade other countries, but Indonesian people do a lot of different things, okay? But they don't really think about the phenomena that they're actually doing. So that's why we need this concept to explain what people are doing. So when people, when we have the phenomena 
uh, the phenomenon of Anak Jaksa, another phenomenon of Anak Bandung, another phenomenon of Anak Salatiga, and so on, we know that, ah, okay, that's actually translanguaging in practice, and we don't get confused anymore. And then, um, it's not so much about practices of language mixing because um, translanguaging in the complex and dynamic context of superglossia actually allows for the emergence of new linguistic varieties. According to Professor Jan Blomert, he said that we perpetually adjust our language repertoires to those we have to communicate with, okay? And the process, right, when we do that, we often come up with entirely new forms of language use. And these new forms of language use year by year and decade by decade, they could make up, right, as one separate entity of language, uh, as a language in itself, or as a new dialect. And sometimes they become new languages. So that's why I call it here, I say it here, the emergence of new linguistic varieties. So in the context of Indonesia, Indonesia super diversity means we have intensive and dynamic language contact between speakers of different languages and dialects. And this contact gives rise, okay? Gives rise, usually gives rise to linguistic accommodation, which in turn could lead to new varieties, whether languages or dialects. The process, however, usually is gradual and it involves more than changes in linguistic rules. There are so many examples showing the existence of this phenomenon, and I'm just going to show you two of them, right? One of them is not very far from Salatiga. It is um, in one of the regions in, in West Java called Chirbon. So in Chirbon, um, people in Chirbon um, there are three regencies, okay? Three regencies, Chirbon, Indramayu, and Kuningan. These three regions, regencies, they don't speak Sundanese. Most people in West Java speak Sundanese. They also don't speak Javanese. Most people in Central Java speak Javanese. In, in East Java, they also speak um, Javanese. However, people in these three regions, they speak a uh, different kind of linguistic variety. Um, because they have their own um, dialects of Sundanese, right? Uh, in Cherubon dialect, in Indramayu dialect, and Kuningan dialect. And these dialects are affected by the Javanese language, by the Javanese language. Um, slowly but sure, the complexity of language contact and practices of language mixing among people in this region seeds. Okay, results in a new linguistic variety. And that new linguistic variety is now called Chirabon. So Chirabon distinguishes itself from Sundanese and Javanese, and now the language is spoken in Chirabon, Kuningan, and Indramayu. This is based on a thesis of a um, PhD. Um, of a, uh, of a PhD thesis by Supriyat Noko, a graduate of Universitas Indonesia in 2015. So this language has emerged as a result of continuous translanguaging at the local level. So you can imagine, right? Now we have social media. Now people are very fluid. They use um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. And they use many different um, features of different languages, you know? and it has become a lot more super diverse than before, you know, not just the emergence of um, Chirbon, you know, as it at the local level, you know, when people, um, excuse me, when people talk in the market, just like the people in the picture here, but also when people talk in social media, media, especially among the young people. Now we go to the Bayanuwangi um, Regency in East Java, uh, a similar case, this is um, about the Osing people. So if you're familiar with uh, people in East Java, we have people living in Pachitan, people living in Surabaya, Malang, and so on. And then we also have people living in Banyuwangi. And people living in Banyuwangi, um, they are very different from their neighbors, right? Because their culture is, uh, is like a or is it a mix of Javanese culture, the East Java culture, and the Balinese culture. That's the Osing people with their traditional outfit. So Osing as a new language has also emerged as a new language, even though language policy still sees Osing as a dialect, okay? So according to the Baden Bahasa, 
the uh, language planning agency in Indonesia, OSING is still a dialect. However, according to um, research by um, ARPS, for example, it has actually developed into a new language because of complex diversification of language practices um, has also been behind the emergence of OSING, also spelled OSING as a language rather than a dialect. So over time, translanguaging gives rise to, to OSING. So a final word here um, is that now we have a word that, um, that has got um, a lot of settings where speakers, you know, and they are dead territorialized because they are not confined to specific territory and they use a mixture of languages when they interact with different groups of people. When they interact with family, with friends, with co-workers, they read English and other global languages on their computer screens and then they watch local, regional or global broadcasts and they access popular culture in a variety of languages. And these settings will become even more widespread in the future. And for that reason, then super diversity will become, will become the standard modality. So that statement was made in 2015 and it has, be, it has uh, been realized now because that's actually the case happening in 2023, eight years later. So what is the conclusion? Uh, my conclusion is simple. We have um, our understanding of language and language practices that have been um, that have been influenced by monolingual ideology and perpetuated by structuralist linguistics. And language practices actually extend beyond simple compartmentalization of languages. Okay, prescribed by the monolingual ideology and perpetuated by structuralist linguistics. Okay, and then the second one is that translanguaging suggests a departure from structuralist linguistics and monolingual ideology. It is common in super diverse contexts. We need translanguaging as a new concept to explain fluid, dynamic, and complex complex use of language practices. Indonesia, as a linguistic ecology, is a complex, dynamic, and and polycentric super diverse context. Um, the conceptions that we had earlier, like diglossia, complex multilingual diglossia, polyglossia, complex diglossia, polyglossia, they do not account to account for, they do not account for the true complexity, dynamism, and polycentricity of Indonesia's linguistic ecology. And in my view, superglossia accounts for all the factors, right, in terms of Indonesia's complex, dynamic, and polycentric linguistic ecology. So now the relationship of superdiversity and translanguaging um, goes like this. Superdiversity through translanguaging is evident in practices of language mixing, right? So the short-term understanding of this is that translanguaging, okay, is evident, um, is exemplified by practices of language mixing. And when that happens at societal level, then we have super diversity. And at a long-term, um, in long-term understanding, this leads to an emergence of new linguistic varieties. Because when people keep mixing different languages or features from different languages within a year, two years, three years, four years, five years, and so on, until decades, then we no longer have new forms of language use, but we have new linguistic varieties. That's why we have had Chirbon. That's why we have had Osing as new linguistic varieties. I guess that is all. Um, that's the end of my presentation. That's exactly one hour and a half. Uh, so that's the references. Uh, Professor um, Joseph Mambu, I have finished. Yeah, I welcome any questions that uh, participants may have. Yeah, thank you. For Yeah, let's give him a big applause. Sorry, once again, I'm still unmuted. So uh, thank you for the enlightening presentation by Pak Suban Zain. And this is very enlightening. Uh, gives a lot of information that uh, we think are kind of uh, confusing, but uh, the presentation makes it very evident that the terms are interrelated and translanguaging gives a special space, especially in the Indonesian context, where actually uh, we are very 
uh, super diverse and translanguaging is uh, the, uh, the linguistic phenomenon to describe the complexity of super diversity in an Indonesian context. Well, I documented that at least in the chat box, yeah, by, uh, by Suban, at least there are one, two, three, four, five, six, six people, or maybe now seven from Farisa. Um, oh yeah, but I think this last question, how do we differentiate between mixing? I think it has somehow been addressed in the presentation. So I'd like to start from the first question in the chat box, yeah, but I think this is an interesting question uh, from Tokumi. Uh, I'm not sure, Bapa or Ibu, yeah. May I have a question? I'm not sure how we know that the incorporation. Uh, I think when we talk about the, uh, I know the Muslim or the Islamic um, uh, uh, community here. I'm not. If I don't exactly remember the term. I'm not sure how we know that the incorporation is the sign as the sign of piety rather than submission. Yeah, that's the question. Yeah. So, um, this is one of the. Can questions. you um? Can you um, write down the question in my chat box because I cannot see the question, Prof. Joseph Mambu. Oh. It does okay. not appear in my in my chat box. Oh, okay. Can I just repeat the question then okay. orally uh, from Tokumi here? I'm not sure how we know the incorporation is the sign of piety rather than submission. Uh, uh, yeah, that's the short question related to Sunnah community or something like that. How can we tell that it's the incorporation of, the incorporation of something is the sign of piety rather than submission? I think okay. that's one of the uh, yeah, that's slides that that's I a good answer. question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, of course, the idea, yeah, of course, the idea of um, incorporating Arabic um, phrases and words um, is seen as a kind of submission, right? Uh, because uh, it is among the people, it is uh, believed that the Arabic language is a very important um, language, um, and um, it is a language of of the Quran and it is um, the language of um, the worship, right? Um, where you cannot um, undertake the salah without without um, saying something in Arabic, right? Without uttering words in Arabic. Um, however, my observation is not on the spiritualistic um, angle, okay? So my um, observation is on the linguistic angle, right? So uh, I cannot, say um, for certain whether that is a case of submission or a case of piety because no one can measure piety right no one can measure piety um, there is no piety is a construct but it cannot be measured qualitatively or quantitatively someone who does all the religious duties does not mean that pers pers we can see evidence of that person being pious Right, but it doesn't mean that that person is pious in the eye of God. Okay, that's the simple um, argument for this. Right. However, um, what I'm saying is that the idea of incorporating this is then understood even by the people in that community as a sign of piety. Okay, so the people in there they understand this. You know that if you um, incorporate um, the Arabic words into your statements um, in, when you talk using antum, ana, and so on. It is not only a sign of submission, it is a sign of piety, okay? Um, I know this because um, I have had friends, you know, being invoked in that community. And I know um, I observe them very closely. And when I talk to them, I use, you know, the same terms that they are using, you know, I try to become part of them because I want to observe them very closely, um, you know, how the linguistic practice works, you know, from the inside perspective, not just from the um, outside perspective. So if you're looking at the spiritual angle, then the answer would be different, right? My, an my answer is based on the linguistic or um, angle, the social linguistic observation that I have done throughout the years. So for that reason, uh, the simple answer would be, it is not just a sign of submission, right? Islam in itself means submission, but also a sign of where somebody is regarded as 
buyers, okay? So when that person uses a lot of Arabic words, right, then other people, you know, um, will say, oh, that person is very soleh, yeah? Soleh means pious. That person is very pious. That person is someone who fears God and so on. And that has to do with pride and prestige among people in that community. I hope that um, answers the question. Okay, great. I think that answers the question. Before we move on to the next question, I'm not sure if I'm still muted. Can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear okay. you. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the next question, there is a request, and I think because there are 83 of us here on the online room, online Zoom room, so we can have our photo session first. And I'd like mm -hmm. to remind the uh, the participants to fill in the attendance list. So if it is not yet available, please Sanditya, my student, to give out the form. And if you don't mind, please uh, open the uh, uh, turn on the camera so we can have a look or we can have our best pictures before we leave for uh, uh, another uh, function or things that we do after this session yeah okay uh, who will take the picture I think uh, somebody I will take the somebody picture help. okay great Masandi Masandi will take the picture yes. Yes. yes or you can and pin us okay, all well, participants, please turn on your camera so that we can see your face and then we can have a good record of everyone's attendance. Okay. Yeah, we the picture where we... Okay, can. I think somebody needs to turn off the microphone as well. <laughs> All right. Are you done, Masandi? Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, thank you. So the next question here is interesting. Uh, I'll jump to Pa Umam, and Pa Umam is from Atmajaya, and he is preparing for the exam later this week. So <laughs> I appreciate uh, this question. Um, let me read uh, Pa Umam's question. Seemingly, all the terms are in competition with uh, com and are in competition how to integrate between super diversity and translanguaging, what are covered by super diversity also touched by translanguaging, what are the basic differences of these two terms, super, diverse, super diversity and translanguaging. Uh, maybe this one is more important. What are the practical benefits of super diversity and translanguaging in the English as a foreign language context? Yeah, I think uh, it's a pragmatic question. The benefits or the advantages of understanding super diversity in translanguaging in the teaching of English as a foreign language context. I'm not yeah. sure if uh, uh, Suban also has access yeah. to the question. Then you can I, I cannot see the question in my chat box, but okay. I understand um, <clears throat> the gist of the question. So in terms of the differences between super diversity and translanguaging, um, I'll make it very simple. Super diversity provides the context, okay? And then translanguaging is the language practice within the context, right? So when you have, uh, so super diversity also shows the interaction of different named um, linguistic varieties, okay? And practices of language mixing. That's why we have superglossia, okay? And then translanguaging is the process that shows how those uh, linguistic varieties interact with one another in terms of practices of language mixing. So for example, if we have Indonesia as a context, okay, as a whole context, and then in Indonesia, we have 700 languages, okay, more than 700 lang languages, and then all these languages interact with one another, one language is more dominant than the others. Some languages are considered to be more prestigious than others, okay? We look at this complexity of the interaction of these languages, then we're looking at the context. We're looking at super diversity, 
okay? However, if we're looking at how people use um, features of different, different named languages, such as Osing and Balinese and Javanese, then we're looking at translanguaging. Okay, so translanguaging in here, as in the use of different varieties, um, different um, features of um, linguistic varieties in super diverse contexts. Every context is super diverse. It's just that we need to officially name them. Okay, so contexts such as England, for example, has been officially named as a super diverse context. Why? Because somebody has done some research on. Um, on England, you know, being a super diverse context. Belgium, Professor Jan uh, Blomer did that. And then Indonesia, I have done it, you know. In other contexts, Malaysia, Singapore, and others, they are basically super diverse, okay? It's just that people haven't really done research in that context, all right? So once again, super diversity is about the context and then translanguage in the context. And then about the benefits, what are the benefits? The benefits, right, are manifold, right? And two of them are very important. The first one is in terms of language teaching, and the second one is in terms of language policy. In terms of language teaching, it means that we are no longer, um, we are no longer constrained by the monolingual ideology in which the use of the standard language must be present in the classroom at all times. This is what happened at the time of the Orde Baru in Indonesia with the use of standard Indonesian, right? When in fact, many people, especially the teachers couldn't really do it, but the imposition came from, from the government, the, in the, the Orde Baru government of Indonesia at the time of Pak Soeharto. So now we are no longer constrained by that standard language idea. Now we use this flexible um, practice of different um, linguistic features, you know, from different languages in order to learn about one language variety. So the idea is simple. When it comes to language teaching, um, your students speak Javanese, your students speak um, Sundanese and Indonesian, and they want to learn English and you teach them English, okay? The question that you have in mind is that, how can you use features from Sundanese, from Javanese, from Indonesian in order to teach English. Are there concepts that may be equivalent in those languages, which can be beneficial when you explain your lesson to your students? That's the benefit of translanguaging in terms of language teaching. In terms of language policy, it is also important because with this, then we no longer have favoritism, you know, and favoritism um, is hierarchical, right? Favoritism has to do with standard language in which one language is more prestigious than others and others have to succumb to that um, favorite language. And in the end, those languages are neglected. And this usually happens with indigenous languages that have very few um, speakers, okay? We no longer um, look at that point of view in the um, Again, in the past, we used to have that point of view. We used to, people in Brunei Darussalam, for example, or people in uh, the Philippines, for example, they thought that Filipino, right, the Tagalog language is very important. So they only taught Filipino and the English language. So that's why the Philippines um, had the policy, the bilingual policy happening for many decades, okay? Now the Philippines government has changed that idea because of the influence of translanguaging. One of the, inf um, one of the forces that influences um, the Philippines language policy is translanguaging where it actually, um, it actually pushes the uh, education policy makers in the Philippines to also acknowledge, right? To also acknowledge regional lingua francas, okay? Um, in the Philippine um, region and also indigenous languages. So that's why now they not only teach English and the Filipino language, they also teach other indigenous languages. And if I'm not mistaken, four of them are regional lingua francas. So that is a huge step, you know? It's a very important step, something that was not 
done you know, 20 or 30 years ago. It's a great advancement, even though 16 languages does not account for everything because the Philippines has got at least 104 languages in its all territory, right? Indonesia has got 707 languages, you know, and question is how many languages do we teach, you know, for our, um, to our children, you know, it's a big job, it's a big homework, you know, for, our, for us, for our government, you know, to be able to give linguistic rights to our children so that they learn English, they also learn Indonesian, and they also learn indigenous languages. So, um, the second part of the policy that is important is related to my last statement earlier that um, the importance of translanguaging here is that to give recognition to indigenous languages, to languages that are spoken by very few people. So that when we learn English, we learn Arabic, Mandarin, and so on, it's not just English or Arabic or Mandarin, but also about how those indigenous languages, Indonesian and so on, can be utilized to teach and to learn those languages. That's okay. Yep. Yeah, thank you. That uh, you uh, walk an extra mile by responding to the issue of language policy in, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to language teaching. We have an interesting question, Pak Suban. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, quite a lot of questions. Uh, let's see how far we can go. This is an amateur question according to Pak Fajaruddin, but I think this is interesting. When it comes to translanguaging, do we use languages at uh, one same straight line instead of different lines for different languages? And I think in one of the pictures you mentioned earlier, it's not simply about one part of the brain is in Mibas, Indonesia. Uh, uh, is there any, I think, I think one of the uh, implied question is that, is there any uh, neurolinguistic um, research that can verify that uh, translanguaging is really the phenomenon where all languages are not scattered, uh, but it's a, uni uh, a unified entity or something like yeah. that. Well, and do we have, <laughs> and, and that's the, the other line of inquiry that Pak yeah, Pak yeah. asked is, yeah. are we supposed to be telling students about this or what? Yeah, mm, okay. maybe you have some. Yeah, that's a very that. interesting question. Um, the argument that, has been made by Professor Ricardo Otegui and Professor Ophelia Garcia um, is very much pedagogical and philosophical, not neuroscient, um, neuroscientology, you know? So it is not based on neuroscience, um, scientific, research, scientific research, because we haven't, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't come across um, any studies that um, verify verify this, you know, how the language actually works, you know, in the brain, you know, identifying, you know, English and then Mandarin and then Dutch and German, you know, working all together. And then we have one sentence, you know, having all features of these different languages. I haven't come across that. You know, well, who knows, maybe in five years. <laughs> yeah, um, the idea whether um, we have to tell the students about this, it's just, it's a matter of a philosophical discussion, as I said, if we make a representation of one part of the brain belonging to Mandarin, another part belonging to Portuguese, another part belonging to German, then, you know, we can just separate the brain, right? Which one is bigger? Is it Indonesian or Arabic? Is it um, Indonesian or Dutch? Or, or is it Mandarin or, or German, you know? It depends, you know, on the level of proficiency of, of the person. So um, when we make the distinction of those um, parts of the brain, that's just a philosophical argument, you know, because of course we cannot really divide the brain, you know, the way <laughs> the way the diagram shows, right? It's impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Pasuban. And I think at least there are two other questions that are uh -huh. pertinent to our discussion today yes. from Odysseus B. Temara. If people constantly use multiple languages when they are communicating with others, how do we measure the proficiency of their use of those languages? Will you need different standards for that in the future when translanguaging became more common globally? So it's like uh, teaching uh translanguaging oh sorry test of translanguaging as a foreign language or something yeah. yeah yeah um it's a very interesting question it is a question that i've also had and actually i um i presented a um <clears throat> i presented at two different conferences one in singapore and another one in in china 
um, as a result of my uh, British Council research. So if you are interested, um, have a look at English as a subject in basic education, right? English as a subject in basic education in ASEAN. Um, I've got two books about the subject and then it relates to this question. And as part of my research, um, I, can I can share with you the link um, to that presentation if you're interested. It, it is related to the idea of translanguaging, okay? Uh, being part of language proficiency, okay? If you look at the most advanced uh, pedagogical approach coming from the CFR, translanguaging is not included, right? The big question that I had in mind at that time, we're talking about 2021, 2022, last year, um, I, I had the same question in mind and then I tried to dig deeper and then I came up with this idea of, of a framework, right? A framework that can actually accommodate translanguaging. So this framework needs to accommodate translanguaging, you know, as teachers' ability to use different features, okay? Teachers' ability to use different features of linguistic varieties in order to, to teach a certain language or a target language, whatever the target language is, you know, Mandarin, Portuguese, German, Dutch, English, whatever, okay? And we need to include that. So translanguaging, yes, should be part of that competence. So translanguaging also needs to be seen as a competence. It is not just, you know, the ability to switch, but also to think about which switch would benefit my students the most, which switch, what words, in what context, you know, and when would benefit my interlocutors the person or the people who are speaking with me, you know, because with translanguaging, it may not be, um, it may not be uh, relevant or it may not be useful or it may not be helpful at all for our interlocutors. It may not be uh, helpful at all for our students. So we need to think about those questions in mind. So that's why um, my answer would be an absolute yes, but this is still hypothetical, right? This is still a hypothetical, and I encourage you, you know, <laughs> to um, to think about this. I will be happy to share yeah. the link. I will send it to uh, Professor Joseph Mambu, and then you can share it. Um, the conference organizer can share it with the participants. And if you have already um, filled out the link, then you will receive. Um, you have already filled out the registration link. Then you will receive a link um, showing um, the. What is it? Um, this these two presentations. Okay, so my answer would be an absolute yes. Um, this is still hypothetical because we still need research. Um, uh, in the future, I envisage translanguaging as a competence, not just a, uh, as a competence for language teachers, yeah. not just as the ability to switch um, between languages. Or maybe the way I frame it, translanguaging as a scaffolding tool to help teachers teach a target language. I'm just summarizing what you're trying to say, but maybe from yes. my angle. Yeah, I've actually have discussed that in one of my book chapters. Yeah. Translanguaging is a scaffolding feature. <laughs> and great, great. In, um, on the 1st of July, I will be giving a presentation on translanguaging in the primary English classroom. And in the talk, I will touch upon scaffolding. So if you are interested, then I will um, please um, Google Peltin, if you find Peltin 2023, uh, P-E-L-T-I-N, Primary English Language Teaching in Indonesia, um, organized by um, Dr. Ika, uh, Damayanti from Universitas Pendidikan Indonesia. I will be one of the speakers in there. Um, I will be talking about translanguaging um, as a means of scaffolding in the primary English classroom. Okay, yeah. sounds great. Well, we still have a number of questions, but I think I'm spotlighting this, and I think this is related to your firm, uh, earlier discussion, and actually this is uh, related to the notion of transformative yeah, yeah, uh, what, uh, this is from Bulan dari Santoso. What is your opinion, Pak Suban, about the transformative limit of translanguaging? In what sense can translanguaging be transformative in relation to the Indonesian context? Okay. Um, 
I'm not sure whether the term transformative limit of translanguaging that Ibu Wulandari Santos refers to a certain um, terminology. However, from my understanding of this is that translanguaging does not answer everything, okay? Translanguaging is useful, but it does not provide answers to everything. There is no theory that is perfect, right? As life itself is not perfect and nobody is perfect, right? If we go to the philosophical argument, but the idea of um, translanguaging have, having transformative impact is that there are so many ways in which learning um, can be a lot, can be accelerated through translanguaging. And there are so many research, right? There's manifold of research identifying how a sense of identity is heightened, right? Or amplified through the use of translanguaging pedagogy, right? Another transformation would be in the way trans, uh, in the way translanguaging um, empowers teachers because teachers who only rely on the use of the target language, they are constricted, you know? And their idea of um, the target language is also very much limited. So when they actually translanguage, then it empowers them. It gives a sense of identity. It gives a sense of culture. It gives a sense of community belonging. That's according to um, different research studies. However, it also has limitations. Even though it is transformative, translanguaging does not give answers to everything. For example, some teachers, because they have limited proficiency, may actually hide behind translanguaging so that to the extent that they do not use the target language, they only use the first language. In other words, they teach English, they don't use English at all, they just use Bahasa Indonesia. So what is the whole point of teaching English? And then they would say, oh, I'm doing in, in football, if you know Johan Cruyff, we have total football, right? And this person would argue, oh, I'm doing total translanguaging, sir. No, that's not total translanguaging, right? That's hiding behind, you know, language incompetence. And some teachers, you know, may, may do that, you know, and I've seen evidence of teachers doing that. No, it's not the way to go, right? By translanguaging, that means the, the judicious use of different features of languages, sometimes using Indonesian, sometimes using Javanese or Sundanese would be useful in different contexts when explaining this. In a different context, you need to use the target language, okay? When you can employ that carefully, we can, when you can do that judiciously, then you trans, your translanguaging is effective. If not, then, you know, we need more practice in terms of classroom discourse on how to make translanguaging more effective and efficient in the language classroom. So I hope that answers the question, unless Ibu Wulandari Santoso has got a different view of what transformative limit of translanguaging means. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, maybe one last question okay. from the floor orally Please. if you want, because I, I can just read this briefly from my colleague, Pat Christian, and I think this or has already been answered in the literature. Do you think translanguaging includes the concept of transcending beyond not only linguistic boundaries, but also beyond modalities? As far as I remember, yes, Li Wei discussed multisensory, multisemiotic, and multilinguistic, uh, multilingual. So it's not simply about linguistic boundaries, but yeah, it has, it has been addressed in the literature. Yes. Uh, so maybe one uh, spontaneous question. Yes, I've question. also written a paper on that, Translanguaging and Multiliteracies. And mm -hmm. Professor Alastair Panicook has got a book mm -hmm. chapter on trans, um, the Handbook of Superdiversity, if I'm not mistaken, about translanguaging and multimodality. Yeah, so, mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. so the answer is yes. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, one more question. If you want to raise your hand and... I'll ask the question orally, so there is a more lively discussion, not only the written uh, questions on chat box. If anyone has a pressing concern, pressing question that you would like to ask before we end in one or two minutes, because we are about to be running out of time here. Anyone? I'm not going to conclude everything because I think the explanation from Pak Suban is already very comprehensive. And it, I think, uh, provides us with more, uh, more light 
into the issue of uh, linguistic phenomena that is very complex in the context of Indonesia, especially. Anyone? Yeah, okay, Buneni, you seem to have a burning question in mind. Go ahead, Buneni. I still cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. So this is not a question actually, but uh, I think there are some questions that are still unanswered. So if Suzanne uh, can provide his email address or contact so that people who are interested in this matter or would like to discuss some more or interested in projects and things like that can actually contact him. If you don't mind, but Suzanne, probably your email address or your social media account can be shared with everyone. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, my <clears throat> my um, WhatsApp or my um, Gmail would be okay. No problem. And um, I, as I said, I will um, I will forward the links to my work um, that are related to translanguaging and super diversity and also um, that relate to um, the use of proficiency um, in terms of translanguaging. Okay. Okay, good. Okay, Puneni. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, is there anything from the committee member that I might have forgotten? I think everyone is happy now. All right. Thank you for the insightful presentation, Pak Suban. Okay, that's from Bugita. Yeah. Thank you, Bugita. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank Singlish. you, Professor yeah. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah, Bugita. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Yeah, as about Singlish, but I think yeah, Singlish is a phenomenon as well. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a very rewarding uh, afternoon. And once again, I'm very grateful to the presence of uh, Suban. It's a really an honor for us to, to uh, have you in Satyawacana. And I hope that this is not the end of our English teaching applied linguistic uh, colloquium. Yeah, this is the first, and we hope to have uh, subsequent e talks. And Pa uh, Suban. Uh, has the honor to be uh, the first speaker. It's an honor to, to be here and to yeah. speak um, in front of everybody. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And uh, have a good evening. Or if there is some sort of announcement from the committee members, please do so. Masandi or Bu Titi? No? Okay. Have a good one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, no, uh, nothing. Yeah, I'm nothing? glad that okay. everything like you know, um, you know, went well. Well, except that that thing. Yeah, there was a technical glitch. That was down for a couple of <laughs> yeah. minutes, but it was okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and you will everyone. be um, sharing the uh, You will be sharing the recordings with the audience. Oh yes, yes. definitely. Yeah. Yes, we can do that. Okay, yeah. great. Thank yes. you. Okay, great. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Thank you very much, Ibu, Bapa. Salam. Thank you, Hope everyone. Everything goes well. On thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pak Subhan, uh, Prof. Joseph, uh, and everyone. But Debbie, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.